Well, hello and welcome to another edition of MEMA Supplier Insights. Uh, very excited to be able to share with you our automotive supplier barometer from the second quarter of 2023. My name is Mike Jackson and I have the pleasure of serving as Executive Director of Strategy and Research at MEMA, the Vehicle Suppliers Association. And today I'm really pleased to be joined by Raj Iyer, Managing Director at Deloitte. Raj, great to have you here with me today. Thank you, Mike. Really happy to be here. Hey, super excited. So our second quarter uh, automotive supplier barometer is on the topics of supply chain, globalization, and sustainability. Well, you know, look, our, our results uh, for our, our second quarter barometer um, index reflect a 44. And so I, I guess I would say that given the fact that there were you know, there, there continue to be many pressures um, that, that ultimately we're, we're in a, you know, the industry continues to outperform, I think, in some ways, um, you know, look realistically uh, 44 represents a, a, a net negative number. 50 is neutral. So we're six points below that neutral level. And we're actually, uh, we've been uh, net negative here for the past five quarters in a row. And so I think, Raj, this really kind of reflects the, the level of pressure that uh, so many of our members and, you know, the, the, the business, the supplier community has been facing here uh, over, you know, over this continued period of time. Um, any, any thoughts or comments here at this point? No, it's true, uh, Mike. I mean, I mean, if you just think about the last, uh, you know, call it 12, 12 months or so, um, you know, we've we've had our suppliers uh, go through uh, a, a really challenging time, and and uh, you know, what what has complicated, uh, let's call it over the last um, several months, is is the you know rise in interest rates, which is uh, really making capital uh, less accessible uh, than than what what it used to be. So as as we recover from the supply chain um, sort of woes, if you will, you know we're starting to face uh, other issues in the marketplace. So uh, really, the, the the you know the supplier community has has endured uh, a, a wide variety of issues. You know, starting with COVID. Um, you know, you talk about some of the supply chain woes, and then more recently, um, you know, uh, some of the strained capital that they had to uh, overcome. Earlier in the year, there's a lot of expectation for. Uh, the prospect of recession. And I don't think we're necessarily out of the woods, but I would say that um, ultimately demand has proven pretty strong, pretty resilient. And so these are positive, but I do think that there are still supply chain pressures. Uh, there was concern here with uh, uh, the longshoremen uh, labor, you know, uh, not having an agreement here for the you know, much of the past year. Um, more recently, uh, rail cars and you know, shortages, and so there, there's, you know, I, I think the industry has has performed well, but we're we're, we're probably in a in a bit of, we're still a bit fragile. Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, I think we have uh, we 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 have uh, a variety of supply chain um, uh, sort of uh, challenges ahead of us. Um, you know, not not uh, not to put the um, electrification um, on on the pedestal here, but you know that that's just uh, one of those areas where uh, you know supply chain is sort of um, you know in the forefront because again that supply chain happens to be nascent in in nature. But if you look at uh, the traditional supply chain, um, you know it it is it is um, still in a fragile state, like you like you say, and um, you know we 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 will have to make sure that we watch uh, every bit of um, uh, not just our tier ones but tier twos and tier threes. All the way to tier end, capital challenges and things like that, um, and 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 really, you know, sustain sustain through this this uh, tumultuous time uh, to uh, to to get to the other side, which which is likely going to be a a sustained um, uh, you know vehicle production of about sixteen to sixteen and a half million units or so here in the U.S. at least. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm going to go to the next slide here. So what we've got here is, uh, you know, list of top industry threats and, you know, not a big surprise. Number one is weakness in the U.S. economy. Right. So, you know, I think what we have seen is uh, maybe um, look concern. And and so, you know, typically with with uh, weakness in the economy, you see a fall off in demand. I think in some ways, though, to your point, right, that uh, you know, demand for vehicles has been undersold for the past few years in a row. And so, if anything, there's there's you know a significant amount of, of pent up demand that still remains, and and so I, I think that that you know weakness in the economy is still very um, very real, uh, but um, you know higher interest rates. I mean, you know, so you know, not necessarily captured in this sentiment here, but higher interest rates are certainly a real factor. But we did get maybe a, a little bit of a a breather in terms of uh, you know Fed Chair Powell uh, kind of you know pausing here, yeah. and so the 
FOMC uh, you know, deciding to to not to raise rates, and yet uh, you know any additional kind of you know sentiment there, uh, given you know some of the additional comments that they made. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's it's it is it is an interesting um, uh, challenge for our Feds, right? To 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 decide whether you know to raise interest rates because I think you know what they're trying to do is obviously curb inflation. Um, you know, what we are seeing in the in the in the labor market though is that you know labor markets continues to stay hot. Um, you know, there are pockets where, you know, there's still a shortage of labor. Um, and, and so how that manifests itself into our, uh, you know, into the way our suppliers operate is they're having a tough time uh, keeping their production lines uh, staffed uh, or manned 100%. Um, in, in many cases, and this is, you know, based on personal experience, um, you know, they're having to, uh, you know, get labor from other areas outside of the area that they operate in. Just to you know uh, maintain their uh, line speeds and and uh, and staffing. So um, the 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 uh, higher interest rates may be a you know maybe a challenge from a uh, capital availability standpoint. Um, the uh, the interest rate, of course, is uh, is is trying to curb inflation, but uh, again. Um, you know, labor continues to be a challenge for our supply base. Even in, in light of a number of the headwinds that we just ta talked about, what I think is interesting here is just, uh, yeah, and it continues to amaze me, frankly, is that the, the supplier industry is incredibly resilient. And, and so here, you're highlighting, look, even in light of some of these you know, significant challenges, what are your, you know, given the current business environment, what do you think are your biggest opportunities? And you mentioned it earlier, you talked about this, you know, shift toward electrification. And so, you know, number two is the, the you know, growth in the BEV segment. So certainly a, a significant number of new nameplates coming, but also business conquest and consolidation. That's the number one. So what's, what's pretty remarkable is for leading suppliers. That are really out front and that have you know have a strong balance sheet that have you know managed you know and, and kept costs under control, uh, pretty remarkable. But here they 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 see opportunity here in the near term and and this you know coupled with the, the next couple you know the idea of, of new products and technologies, new customers and programs. Uh, there's the, some some it's a it's a pretty dynamic time, no question. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you know we talk about business conquest and consolidation. Um, in in reality, um, you know the the you know if you think about what is going on at the OEMs, um, uh, clearly the um, OEMs are having to focus on a variety of programs. Um, you know they're having to focus on uh, their existing ICE portfolio. In uh, some cases, their hybrid portfolio, as well as in other cases, their you know their emerging EV portfolio. Uh, you combine all that, and and uh, you know the the, the ability for a supplier to bring in value through, um, you know, uh, uh, serving the legacy ICE portfolio or, or the new EV portfolio with added value, um, you know, beyond what they traditionally offer um, a, a typical OEM. Um, that that you know uh, will will continue to you know keep them in the uh, you know in the forefront. The web segment uh, piece of it, um, I think that's a that's an interesting dynamic in that, uh, you know, we talk about electrification as in just the you know move from um, you know ice powertrains to uh, EV uh, powertrains or BEV powertrains, but in reality there's a bigger change happening on the architecture of the vehicle, which is opening up doors for uh, you know new things that the supply base is able to uh, sort of capitalize on. So if you think about uh, the 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 shift towards BEV, it also comes with uh, what we're calling software defined vehicles. And uh, that basically is creating a new opportunity for suppliers to play a role in areas like ADAS, providing providing a software uh, service beyond the typical hardware that they provide to, to OEMs. No question. I mean, like you said, I mean, new revenue streams, all kinds of new business models. And so, you know, um, absolutely. You know, it, it, it certainly is opportunity. And it's one of these where opportunities come with, you know, new competitors and new, new dynamics. And so, you know, I, you know, obviously we talk about talent and so the, the talent war, but you know, certainly uh, you know, no no shortage of, of, of items to, to contend with, but we'll continue on here. And I think this is an important one because I think, uh, you know, look, what we want is a, a healthy um, industry and that includes, uh, you know, a healthy supplier community uh, to support the, the manufacturers. And so, What's pretty remarkable here is looking at sub-tier to supplier distress. 21, not a big surprise, but it was it was pretty shocking or just like extraordinary in terms of the intensity of, of distress. We saw almost a third of respondents indicate that they've seen a significant increase in distress. Uh, another 50% indicate you know, a slight increase. 
um, what we've seen here more recently in, in 22, and more of the same. Uh, and then more recently, I think right, where we're at is just under 40% yeah, with a slight increase, 12% with uh, a, a significant increase. Now, what's remarkable about that is that's on top of already very high levels from the past two years. Yep. And so even with almost a third of respondents indicating no change, well, no change still means very elevated levels of distress. And so we know there's been a significant number of uh, additional workouts and and. Uh, all kinds of activity here on the restructuring side since the start of this year. You know, higher interest rates not helping on that front either. But um, you know, uh, some some thoughts there from your standpoint. You did mention you know the importance of cost recovery and and maybe looking at you know having some pretty candid conversations. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, again, like I said, the past several years, you know, we were able to sustain through uh, what was a pretty challenging time for our supply base. Um, uh, largely because you know capital was was available, and uh, you know we could you know liquidity was not an issue, right? Um, so even if we had to um, you know think about working capital uh, as as a main driver, uh, our our supply base was able to you know work through that. Um, uh, you know get to 2023, and um, capital has now become a little bit more tight, you know given the interest rates, mm -hmm. but um, luckily volumes are starting to pick back up uh, a little bit, so that that is helpful. But uh, you know. Uh, you know what you have on the on the um, on the second graph here is spot on with respect to um, you know what we're seeing in the marketplace. You know we're seeing material costs being one of the main drivers for um, you know why uh, some of the suppliers are not able to you know sustain the profitability. In some cases, they're able to recover that through uh, you know discussions and and price increases with uh, OEMs. In other cases, not so much. Uh, the labor-related um, issues, uh, you know, we've talked about, again, inflation only means that, you know, wages go one way. Um, they don't seem to go the other way, right? So labor-related issues will certainly complicate that, uh, that cost recovery, if you will, um, in, in, the, in, the sh in the short term. And, and as a result, you know, we have to continue to watch distress, um, you know, more so at the tier two and, and beyond uh, levels. Um, uh, you know, to, to make sure that we have viability, uh, you know, within our supply base. Hey, listen, uh, Raj, really appreciate your, your expert insights here today. Uh, I want to thank Raj Iyer, Managing Director at Deloitte, for his input here with our uh, MEMA Supplier Insights uh, and, and, you know, helping us to better understand the, uh, the takeaways here from our second quarter 2023 automotive supplier barometer on supply chain globalization and sustainability. Raj, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Mike. Really happy to be uh, happy to have this uh, have had this conversation, and uh, um, and uh, hope to do this again in the future. Perfect. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, look for us next time. Uh, our MEMA Supplier Insights, and we'll if we can be a resource, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much. Take care.